So, yeah, I'm uh, Mathieu Tacon from the Max Planck Institute for Solid State Research in Stuttgart, and I first like to uh, really uh, thank the organizer for inviting me, and especially as an experimentalist, I'm very honored to be among the few uh, selected people to present some actual data. Although, I have to say that I've seen a lot of data these days because all this numerical uh, work uh, looks very much like experiments now. <laughs> so, but that, this, these are good old experiments that we do, you know, uh, without uh, too many computers. So, I'm going to talk about a recent result that we got from uh, not only X-rays, but actually all kind of photons, including uh, visible light uh, scattering, uh, that gave us uh, recently some very strong evidence for uh, CDW, or at least CDW fluctuations in this uh, underdope group rates. Um, so first, let me acknowledge uh, my collaborators. So I start to be too many of them, actually, so that they can be uh, acknowledged individually. But let me uh, underline first the role of the uh, Department of Bernard Keimer at the Max Planck Institute uh, and, and the role of the students, so Alex Tranio, Michaela Soliu, Mohamed Bakar, and, and uh, Lino Gretarsson, who just started a postdoc with me. Um, uh, they all contributed really a lot to, to what I'm going to present. Uh, and the group of Giacomo Giringeli and Lucio Brajkovic in Politico di Milano, who actually made the first real breakthrough uh, in, in, this, uh, in this old field. Uh, so uh, I'm going to show you experimental data that have been taken on many light sources, and again in collaboration with many groups, uh, including UBC uh, uh, and Princeton, uh, for, the, for the most recent uh, uh, exciting things, uh, I'd say. So. Uh, these are a few outlines. Uh, the first one is scoop rates. Why, why are we still working on this after uh, 20 years, 30 years now almost? And I think we got already uh, nice uh, 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 ideas of that uh, already in this, in this uh, conference. Uh, and, and then I go through the, the discovery of the CDW and show you some uh, very nice, I think, uh, results that we got from uh, the Raman scattering, which is very important to discuss in India, of course. Um, and <coughs> Uh, and about the mechanism of the formation of this uh, charge density wave. So, why are we still working on this? So, we've seen several times already this, this, this very complicated phase diagram, so I'm not going to uh, detail it much more, but I'd just like to quote one of my former teachers uh, who actually introduced me to the, to the high TC superconductivity, Julien Bobrov, who told me that uh, what's nice with scoop rates is that you get the entire solid state physics into one single phase diagram. And the more I work in this, and the more I feel it's true. Um, and one very uh, important aspect of the physics of the, of the cuprates is, of course, this, uh, this T star line uh, that can be drawn either like a very broad line uh, like this, like this crossover, or more and more like a first line at high temperature and a second line at low temperature. Uh, the, the, the first one con corresponding, for instance, to the, to, the, to the onset of the Nernst effect, and the second one to the, the Kerr effect or the sign of the old resistivity uh, that is seen by in, in transport measurements. And the question whether these two phenomena are related or not is actually a very, a very hot topic. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Yeah, no, so, well, okay, then I'm just mixing up the, the transport measurement. But I saw there's, there's, there's this upper line from Typhor is always, is that associated to Nernst? Two? Yeah, well, I, I, okay, there's this neutron sub for sure, the, the, the night shift and anymore, and I thought there was one transport. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah, okay. Anyway, okay, not nerds, so forget about the nerds, but still, people like to draw two lines. <laughs> um, <coughs> And of course, the relations between these two lines and uh, things like these Fermi arcs that we heard about uh, two days, the connection to uh, density wave orders and eventually stripes, or to uh, more uh, uh, fancier uh, theory, like uh, implying these orbital currents or, uh, or strange magnetism occurring here. The connection between all these phenomena is, is really, really open. Um, and among the important questions that are still asked in this field is, of course, what's the origin of superconductivity? Is still debated as we have we just heard, uh, how to turn a strongly correlated uh, insulator into a good metal. That, that also we've heard a very nice uh, talk uh, from, from Michel yesterday uh, with, with some new insights. And what I'm going to talk about is mostly the interplay between 
superconductivity and other possible ground state that you can get when you dope uh, a mod insulator. So from the experimental point of view, why is it so complicated? Well, um, uh, from theory-wise, I'd like to, to summarize scoop rates to copper oxide plane. But as Antoine uh, mentioned uh, earlier today, uh, there's the real material behind. And, and all these materials, so all these families of cooperates rates have their own uh, specificities. And it happens that from the experimental point of view, there is not one family that is suitable for any kind of experiments. The compounds that can be studied by uh, surface technique like STM or, or RPES happen to be highly disordered and, and not suitable to grow large single crystal that would be, make them suitable for uh, measurements of magnetic properties with neutron scattering, for instance. Um, and those that are uh, homogeneous, uh, like, like, like YBCO, uh, they, they don't live well and it's very hard to, to study with surface, uh, with surface method. Uh, so you have to study all of them with different techniques and try to overlap. And of course, on top of that, you get hardcore chemistry issues and how to get this material nice and the cleanest, as clean as possible because uh, we also learned over this, this last 20 years that disorder is a very important issue in all this material. So let me start. Uh, with just a, a bit of, of results that have been obtained in the lanthanum-based cuprates and it's regarding this, this so-called uh, stripe ordering. So it's been found very early on that when you start doping this material, you destroy the antiferromagnetic order and uh, the long-range uh, commensurate antiferromagnetic order and instead you get this kind of uh, incommensurate satellites around each of the magnetic black, black spot. And at the same time, you get satellites around the charged black spot. And it's been interpreted in terms of stripes which become at the 1 8 stopping commensurate with the lattice and gives you uh, these this, this satellites, let's say, at uh, 1 uh, one eighth that you see with, uh, with neutron scattering and 1 fourth in the relative lattice units, uh, 1 quarter uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the charged channel. Um, and this stripe is one of the first and most evident order competing with superconductivity in the sense that when in the few cases where they are known to be really <laughs> static stripes, really a static long range order, you actually destroy completely the superconducting phase. And, and TC goes to zero exactly at that doping level. So the question is, of course, of universal is this, uh, is this stripe picture. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, one of the main uh, counter argument against this, 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 the importance of stripe was, was the study of YBCO that actually showed that this is, is known as a very homogeneous compound as, as far as doping is concerned. And it's also very clean. It's so clean that you can actually see these quantum oscillations. Um, and, um, and it has a fairly high TC compared to the, 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 the other family of the, the, the LABAQ compounds. Um, interestingly, the quantum oscillations, I mean, from the period of these quantum oscillations, there's, there are two, these two weird things. Uh, the first one is, or, and the most important one is definitely that the, 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 the size of the Fermi surface that you could extract from it is very small compared to the full Brillouin zone, so 2%, which indicates that the Fermi surface is very likely reconstructed. So, um, if you go to this, this again, this, this YBCO family and you look at the, at the magnetic structure, the evolution of the magnetic structure as function of doping using um, so quasi-elastic neutron scattering, what you find is also that uh, the, the, the structure becomes incommensurate and that this incommensurability increase as you increase the, the doping level. But at some point, around 10% doping, you don't have static magnetism anymore. You're just left with incommensurate magnetic fluctuations and no more you know, st static orders, which contrasts a lot with, with the, the previous <laughs> pictures. And what we've been using to um, get more insights about this order uh, and, 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 and the physics of uh, dope to IBCO uh, is uh, inelastic or elastic scattering. So just for those of you who are not familiar with uh, this experimental technique, uh, you s we just sent an inter incident particle into an interesting system. This particle is scattered. Uh, there's an energy transfer that allows us to study excitations. And there's a momentum transfer that allows us to study the dispersion of these excitations. And this incident particle can be of various kind, electron, neutrons. And I'm going to focus on, on photons here. So we use photons in, in, in various kind of uh, energy and wavelengths of the uh, regime, starting with the uh, visible light, which is the so-called uh, Raman scattering. And we also go to X-rays in different regimes, so soft X-rays around one kilo electron volt, um, uh, or hard X-rays to get even higher resolution. And this has to be done in the synchrotron. Uh, and uh, well, um, conceptually, all these this, this measurements are, uh, are, are very similar. Um, 
practically, these are all very different things, and, and it's, it's, it's really uh, technologically really challenging to do this uh, uh, with X-rays, at least. Um, and, and one important uh, difference between these, these techniques is that um, with Raman, because you have uh, visible light and low energy, you, you cannot transfer much momentum to your system, so you're stuck to study the zone center excitations, where you can really look at the dispersion of these excitations when you use when you go to X-rays. So let me start now uh, to go to, uh, to the data. So the first insight that we got about Charnassi waves were obtained using, were doing something really different and looking at the resonant inelastic X-ray scattering spectrum from cuprates. So it's a, it's a scattering technique, again, so photon in, photon out. But here, you tune the incident energy of your photon to some very specific absorption edge, which makes the technique element and site specific, which is very nice. Um, uh, and also, because you get some dependence on the polarization of the cross-section, gives you selection rules and allows you to probe different kind of excitation. So this is what has been uh, uh, described in a recent review from uh, Ament and, and collaborators. Uh, you can, in principle, look at phonons, though the, the resolution is a bit limited with that. Uh, magnetic excitations, DD excitation, charge transfer excitations, uh, uh, even though for some reason it's always... Uh, plotted like that from the experimental point of view. So put the zero on that side for some convention that is not clear. So what's exciting with this technique is that it made tremendous progress over the last 15 years. And you can see how the resolution has been improved, uh, starting with uh, 1996 with a resolution of 1.6 electron volt to look at the, uh, uh, the, the lanthanum copper oxide spectrum at the copper L edge here. So you see this big DD excitation. And as the resolution has been improved, mostly by the work of uh, Giacomo and, and, and Lucio. Um, you can really now uh, uh, um, uh, resolve all the DD excitations. And at low energy, you get this elastic line and what is here a magnetic excitation. So we are hoping to get to even better resolutions. So now the resolution is like 130 milli electron volt. It's a bit coarse, but it's enough to look at magnetic excitations of cuprates, which have uh, a J of that, of that order. And hopefully, when that thing is going to be uh, uh, assembled, uh, at the SRF, we can gain another factor of three. But as you can see, I mean, this is a 10 meter long uh, spectrometer arm, uh, and that's going to take uh, six more months or so to, to, to start. But uh, this, this is, we, we, we're getting there. Um, so to make it short, with this technique, you can study the magnetic excitations uh, in the cuprates, look at the dispersion. This has been done and demonstrated by, by Lucio Brajkovic here. And we have been studying uh, the doping dependence of these magnetic excitations over a wide range of doping in all kinds of, of cuprates, and this has been all very interesting uh, results, I think. But the most uh, exciting result was actually contains already in this study, but we didn't notice it uh, straight away. Lucio uh, uh, found it out is that if you look at the momentum dependence of the elastic line uh, of this uh, Rick spectrum, you find clearly that there's a non monotonic behavior. So there is a peak somewhere at a given Q if you look at the dispersion, which actually looks like uh, a superstructure peak, like a, it, it, it looks like a, a, a satellite, really. Uh, so a kind of brack, brack peak, if you like, at the incommensurate value. What we found is that this thing was the same along the, the two directions, so A and B stars. So it was a two-dimensional uh, um, uh, uh, brag, if you like. And uh, the nice thing also with the rigs is that using the, the, the polarization selection rules, you can actually show that this is coming from the charge channel and not from the spin. So this is really corresponding to a bidimensional modulation of the charge uh, density of your system. So I'm going to summarize here some of, the, of all the results that we get uh, um, uh, recently. So importantly, in YBCO, the doping is made by putting some oxygens into some uh, 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 copper oxide chains that are um, away from the, from the planes that are where the interesting physics happened. And it's important to demonstrate and to be sure that this signal that we see is not related to chains at all. And this is 100% sure. There's no doubt about it. Um, uh, first, because we work in, in uh, the twin single crystals, so the chains are all running in, in, into one direction, and that the signal that we observe is bidimensional. And the second thing is that using the side selectivity of resonance scattering, you can actually look at the, the, the signal on the chains and look at the chain superstructure and on, in the plane, and you really see that this corresponds to two different things. So the second thing is that it's biaxial and incommensurate. And uh, interestingly as well, the, the, the incommensurability of the charge modulation 
doesn't match at all the incommensurability of the spin modulation. So I told you that the spin uh, fluctuations were, so to, you're left only with spin fluctuations at these doping levels, so th there's no static magnetism. But if you look at the incommensurability, it doesn't match at all the, the incommensurability of the, of the charge. So these are not stripes. Uh, the third important thing is regarding the temperature dependence of this, uh, of this uh, uh, superstructure peak signal. We found that it appears way above uh, the superconducting uh, uh, transition temperature, although often below the reported T star temperature at these doping levels, which would be more around 250K or 300K even. And uh, the, the correlation lengths, so the uh, corresponding to this, uh, to the, to this charge uh, order, is strongly dependent on temperature. So the, the correlation length, which is the, uh, the inverse of, this, uh, of the full width of maximum of the, of, of the peak here, um, is basically increasing up to the, the critical temperature, the superconducting critical temperature, and then decreasing again in the superconducting. And this is also the first evidence that these are just fluctuations rather than a real order. Um, and the second thing is also tells us that this very likely competes with superconductivity, as also evidence here from the uh, dependence of the intensity of the peak versus uh, the, the temperature. And the last uh, important result is about the doping dependence. So at least in YBCO, where we first found the system, we found that this charge wave was located in a doping region between uh, uh, nine, so now we can go down to 7%, something like that, uh, seven to, uh, to 14%. At very low doping, we see only the modulation of the charge, the, of the spin, sorry, so only a, a spin and C wave, if you like. And at high doping level, we couldn't find uh, any evidence for this charnancy wave, although I've just heard uh, from uh, got some 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 uh, gossip from Aspen that apparently some guys been able to measure quantum oscillations up to uh, to optimal doping now with 100 Tesla. So maybe we should have another look. Uh, so this is a point I'm not going to discuss here. So uh, to be completely fair, there were uh, evidence for. Um, <coughs> charge order prior to, this, to, 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 to our work, or, um, and, and, and this was first found by the group of Marc-Henri Julien in Grenoble using uh, NQR, and they found that using a very high magnetic field, so up to 30 Tesla here, they could find differentiation between uh, different, uh, the, the charge surrounding of different copper sites in the, in the copper oxide plane, uh, whereas an evidence for a field-induced charge order. Um, simultaneously with our work, that was done with soft resonance soft X-rays. Uh, there's been a study of uh, Joanne Chang and Stephen Hayden uh, using hard X-rays, and that, that actually found exactly the same incommensurate order as we do. But the advantage with, uh, with the hard X-rays is that they could also study the C-axis dependence of the signal, and they found this, uh, this uh, doubling of the unit cell along the C-axis, which is very interesting. And also, they could study uh, the field the dependence of this uh, of the signal. So at low field, it looks very much like our data. And they could put 17 Tesla and found that when you suppress uh, uh, the superconductivity by applying a high magnetic field, you actually enhance the, char the charge order, which is also a direct evidence for a competition between charge order and uh, and and um, um, and superconductivity. And yeah, yeah. Yes. I don't know how you push TC because you know these guys are still fighting about what is HC2. But you, 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 you decrease, you reduce TC, and you enhance the chart order. Yeah. And you en That's a very good question. So the, the typical correlation lengths that we get without field are of the order of 20 unit cells. So it's not super long range, but it's not super short range. Uh, and uh, and you can you can go up to uh, a bit more I think 30 unit cells or something like that when you put the field. Yes, Andy. Yes. So yeah, I mean, well, that question is still really open. I think uh, the, the the latest thing that we found is most likely that you get some kind of 1D uh, domain in, in one plane that are alternating, like, like in the stripe picture, but um, that each of, the, of this one-dimensional modulation is imprinting, is uh, 
footprint and to the, the next one. So it's a kind of anisotropic to the order in each of these planes and this is rotated by 90 degrees plan to plan and uh, which just doubles your unit cell. But it's not completely clear yet. I mean, there you really have to make a hardcore diffraction study, which is, you know, not something we are good at, but, but Yes. 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 It could. It could be. Yeah. Ah, that's a terrible question. Uh, <laughs> so that is something. It's very hard to estimate. Uh, but um, let's say, both on the basis of the NMR data and on really, really end waving arguments based on the size of the absorption. Uh, um, uh, signals, we get a, a kind of amplitude of the modulation again. It's very end waving of the order of 0 0.01 all or something like that. But it, it's um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's tough. It's tough because I mean we 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 think we have something like that. Of second, I mean, it's not the second order. It's like yeah, it's 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 the diagonal peak if you like, but which is really really weak and very hard to see. So the second order peak along the the main direction, let's say that would be at the two delta or something. The second harmonic has not been seen as far as I can tell. And this, the problem is that these peaks are diffuse. The correlation lengths are not so big, so the, the widths are are large, and um, and so this this makes you. It's not that it's a small signal, but it's a broad signal. So if you go to second order, it's getting very, very tricky. And you know, there's a lot of things in this crystal when you do diffraction. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a, a terrible job. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good, it's lively. I, don't, I didn't show that plot, but there is a corresponding plot here of the correlation length, and the correlation length is in, I mean, the width of the peak, the peak is narrowing as you increase the, the magnetic field. So, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's not, I think it's rich, okay, I, this, these are not my data, so I can, I can tell you, I haven't, I've never been doing measurement of these things, but. Um, so. Well, another very important point is whether this thing would be universal or not. Is that like an intrinsic property of a copper oxide plane, a doped copper oxide plane, or is it something just, you know, that happened to happen in YBCO? And for that, we've been looking for other things. And of course, you're very aware of all these uh, 4A checkerboard things that have been seen with uh, surface technique like STM. Um, and it was really big question to, to know whether we can reconcile uh, our data with, with the STM data. And uh, it happened that yes, we can, uh, and we did that in two two one two. And actually, I'm very uh, happy that these two papers were accepted in the same time in science and get this back-to-back -back publication. So it's two science paper um, uh, that were uh, put online uh, a couple of weeks ago, but the definitive version is still not 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 published. And finally, we've been working with Martin Graven, and we also found the same signal in the mercury compound. Uh, and, and remarkably, in these three compounds compared to YBCO, the correlation length is always uh, uh, much lower. So it's more like five or six unit cells rather than, than, than 20. Um, but still, in all these compounds, we found the, the charge and C wave peaks with really comparable incommensurabilities. So it might change a bit this from system to system, but it's always of the order of 0.3 relative lattice units with a slight doping dependence. Now, let me go back to the 214 families where these stripes were, were, were found first. And, and of course, this was the first resonance scattering work done in cuprates by Peter Abamonte and, and George Savatsky. And what they found there is that it's basically the same signal as we, as we observed uh, in, in this uh, stripey compound. And uh, Fink et al. also measured it in the europium and neodymium doped uh, lanthanum uh, strontium copper oxide. And they found this, this, this same superstructure peak. But when you look at the face, uh, and so, but this is associated always uh, with, with stripe order and you get a modulation of the, of the spin as well as the modulation of the, of the charge. So uh, what we've been doing in collaboration with, uh, with the group of John Hill at, uh, at, at Brookhaven is just to take the very same instrument in the very same condition 
a crystal of YBCO and a crystal of uh, one-eight stop uh, Labacchio that we got from John Fonquada, and uh, to do the resonance scattering and just to try to compare the, 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 the absolute intensity. So of course, the correlation length is much larger in the, in the case of the, uh, the Labacchio. Uh, but if you look at the integrity, the intensities of the peaks, do you find actually the same, uh, the same size for YBCO and Labacchio? So it's not a completely different story. And the second interesting thing, if you go back and look into details of this uh, striped ordered phase, uh, phase diagram, you always find that the spin order is uh, setting up at much lower temperature than the charge order. So finally, you could think of it as a, as a charge order driven story. Like, you know, the charge order is really the intrinsic properties of the, uh, of the, of the, of the copper oxide plane when you, when you dope it. And then at lower temperature, you can lock in or not uh, um, uh, a magnetic um, uh, a magnetic order uh, um, uh, to, to, this, to this charge modulation for a reason that, that, that's not really clear uh, to me. So just a summary here of all the families of, uh, of cuprates in which we've been able to observe uh, the modulation of the charge, whether it's related to stripes or not, so the 214, which, is, which happen to be all the families of cuprates except for the thallium for a very good reason that you don't have underdoped thallium cuprates. Uh, but still, we searched for it and we couldn't find anything in the, in the, in the Italian. So, some questions. Is this charnacy wave the pseudo gap? So, no, I, I mean, my, my personal feeling on that is that it's not the case because uh, the, the, this, this CDW signal always appears at a temperature which is much lower than what is in, for instance, in, in the night shift in NMR. Uh, although in some systems like the 2201, they can be fairly closed. Uh, so is there a real thermodynamic phase transition? So is that really long range order? Um, yes, but only if you put a high magnetic field. So you have to go above 1720 Tesla to really see a, a thermodynamic signature of, uh, of uh, this, this charge order when you suppress superconductivity. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the next question, so if it's not a real order and you're dealing only with fluctuations, at least in the absence of magnetic field, uh, so can you associate any energy scale uh, to, this, to these fluctuations, and, and, and can you account for that charge density wave in, in terms of conventional pyres uh, terms, which is mostly this, the only theory I can, I can understand uh, from the beginning to the end myself. So before going into uh, to this detail, I'd just like to show a bit of, uh, of a Raman result. So of course, uh, many people here must be familiar with uh, Mr. Raman, which was the first non, yeah, five minutes. So the first non-white person to receive a Nobel Prize in 1930. Hmm? He was a professor here. I just, I just learned that. And I learned that there's a Raman museum that I'm hoping to visit uh, by the end of my stay. Uh, and so this is an elastic scattering of, of visible light. And we're just looking uh, here at, at phonons. Um, so phonons in, in cuprates is, is a bit of a boring thing. It's been well established and well studied for, uh, for decades now. It's almost one of the first things that has been looked at. Uh, from the material science point of view. And here I show you the Raman spectrum at room temperature of many of uh, at, at different dopings in, in YBCO, so from uh, optimal doping here to, to, to under dope regime. And this is well known. I mean, this, this is all allowed by symmetry from, your, uh, from, from the crystallographic structure. And uh, what has been very, very surprising is when you cool this, um, this uh, compounds down, so in certain resonance condition, to be, to be completely honest, what we found and, and actually, we found that before we found the, 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 the X-ray evidence for Charn and C-Wave. And it was completely ununderstandable at the time for me. Um, and you found a lot of new phonons. So it's, it was just crazy. So we thought maybe it's a problem related to the chains or oxygen reordering. And, and it took us a lot of work to, to, um, to find out that, no, uh, this has to be related by the Charn and C-Wave. So the best evidence for that um, is, is actually that when you look at the temperature dependence of that thing, I'm just going to, to skip this. Uh, this peak appears in the normal state. Uh, there, they are, their intensity is maximized at TC, and then they decrease again in the superconducting state, which no phonons that behaves reasonably would ever do. And, um, and more recently, we also did this study under the magnetic field, and that's also very impressive. I think that if you look uh, at uh, the, the, these new phonons as function at, at with 0 and 14 Tesla using Raman scattering, you find that all the, the, the phonons that are, um, let's say, uh, allowed by symmetry in YBCO, they don't care about the field as they should do. But the new phonons, they all increase 
uh, with field, just as the, the, the supercircuit peak. So it really uh, established that this, uh, this, uh, this magnetic field, uh, this, this new phonons are related with the charge and C wave, and it's been published after almost five years uh, uh, recently in FISRA B. So the big advantage of Raman scattering is that you don't have to go to synchrotron. You can do that at home. Uh, and you can map out phase diagrams very nicely and found that actually the charge and C wave uh, doesn't have really doesn't this, this, this has more like a dome like shape uh, temperature dependence compared to the um, to the T star or the Kerr effect uh, in, in in other compounds. So one thing though is that the the Raman is always like 20 or 30 k above the X-ray signal, so it might be just an effect of the sensitivity because then. I mean, this, this signal is, uh, is very easy to see. It's, it's very makes the, the, the technique very sensitive compared to the X-rays. Um, but also might be a, just a, uh, an effect, a finite frequency effect, because your phonons are probing your charge density as, as a finite frequency compared to uh, diffraction, uh, X-ray diffraction. So as the German mentioned, I may not have time to go really into the details of my Last part, but I will sneak into because I had a lot of questions that make me lose some time. <laughs> uh, so this is just the conventional tires picture for um, uh, for the formation of a, of a charge uh, density wave, and what you get usually is that you get a, a strongly anisotropic Fermi surface with a good nesting wave vector that gives a peak in your charge susceptibility, and when you turn on electron phone coupling, you just uh, uh, destabilize the lattice and create a static distortion uh, at the wave vector at which this electron, the electronic susceptibility is picked. So there's two questions to answer there. Is, is there any Fermi surface nesting in this underdope group rates? And is there any signature of electron form coupling? So uh, maybe just stick to the first one because it's related to this work of uh, with, 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 uh, Damacelli. And what we found is that so in YBC, it's always hard because we don't have much information about the Fermi surface, uh, at least from the experimental point of view. But in BISCO, we do, and uh, it's been measured very intensively using RPES. And, uh, and you know that there are these, these Fermi arcs. And uh, what we, to, to, to make it short, uh, the wave vector at which we found the modulation can never be associated with the antinodal nesting of the non-interacting Fermi surface. It's always too small. And the only wave vector that matches uh, the modulation that we observe is actually corresponding to the tip of these arcs, which somehow tells us uh, that this, uh, this charge and C wave, so re again, rather than being the pseudogap, might actually be an instability of the pseudogap Fermi surface itself, so uh, a kind of instability of the arcs. But of course, we have to keep in mind that it's a very unusual process because that is a very, very, very poor nesting. Okay, so this is the wave vector is the only wave vector, the only place where we can put that wave vector. But nesting-wise, it's very bad. I mean, this when you when you plot the the, the 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 your charge susceptibility here, in that case compared to that case, here you get a real divergence, and you would expect actually a big instability here, but you get this instability only in the case of this poor man's nesting, and. Uh, that's the question. I, I try to ask RPS people, maybe uh, Atsushi has, uh, has, has an opinion on that. Uh, I couldn't find two RPS people who agree on that. Well, are you? <laughs> hmm? Well, my answer here is very simple. So these are the experimental data that have been taken on BISM 2201 using RPS, and it's been taken at one temperature. No, I know, I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean, and I don't have a clear answer to that. <laughs> but again, uh, uh, some people uh, would tell you that yes, I mean, can eagle, and, and they would tell you that this 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 Fermi arcs they are depending on temperature. Uh, but but other people like ZX, they, they would tell you that it does not. So I'm. I'm um, uh, and then we studied uh, phonons, and I have just no time to go into this phonon business. I just uh, show you the kind of. Uh, Beamline that you need to do that, it's fairly big and impressive. And uh, there's a lot of phonons. And just to, to say that, because that's my favorite result ever, uh, we've been able to actually see this charge and C wave uh, using uh, good old diffuse scattering. You know, you just, you just 
You just take a rod of your sample, you put it in the X-ray beam, and you make a map of the reciprocal space. You cool it down using a cryo stream. It's, it's the simplest experiment on Earth. And, and you just need to get a good detector. So we use this uh, detector that are used usually for protein crystallography. And, and we just found the satellites. So the question is, why nobody found that before? I don't know. <laughs> it was very easy. And uh, I'm not going to discuss the phone effect. And with this, I just thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I want to uh, come back to this question of uh, T star versus uh, the, yeah. the, C, the C, the DW. Mm -hmm. So in the electron dope cuprates, there's a factor of two difference between T star and T nail. Nevertheless, yes. I mean, uh, the, the, the T star I def define as the temperature at which you start to have a pseudo gap in optical or to lose pieces of the Fermi surface. Okay. So, so nevertheless, the pseudo gap comes from the anti-ferromagnetic fluctuations. Mm -hmm. And one way to see this is that the thermal de Broglie wavelength scales like the anti-ferromagnetic correlation length when yes. T star begins. So my question is, uh, in your case, how big is the correlation length for CDW at T star? Well, there's no CDW at T star. So no, but really uh, there, there, still there's fluctuations. No, 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 we don't see the fluctuations Okay, so, so it's then it's zero, really. It's zero. Okay. Yeah, that would be... Or one lattice space. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. So um, one class of experiments related to pseudo-gap and phase transitions that you didn't discuss were the quote-unquote time reversal symmetry breaking things, the Kerr effect experiments of yes, the... Yes. Uh, so is that the same as your CDW, or is that a different phenomenon? So we first thought it was the same, because uh, it's a very natural explanation that you get this uh, chiral order. But uh, um, when I first came out with, with that plot, uh, I mean, some people like to push it. But I, I, I really think that the, I mean, and I know it's not like um, don't, this charge and C wave onset temperature does not increase as you under doped. That's very clear. I mean, for me, it's, uh, there's no doubt on that. Whereas the care effect, uh, what's the, yeah, care, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's, uh, so that's the, yeah, so, so I know, so some people are a bit pushing that point up, but if you be really honest with the data, you definitely don't see it increasing. And, uh, and the auto 2 has an onset temperature of 130K, which is more 160K and the 6.6, that's .6, really, for me, it's, um, and, and now, we are converging on that, at least the soft X-ray community. And, and we, I've seen some recent data from Dave Hawthorne that show the same uh, dome-like shape for the CDW. So I, I don't know how to reconcile that with the care effect now. That's probably up to you. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, uh, we had the idea that this stripe order competes with superconductivity. Yeah. So we see this stripe order for the lanthanum compound, which yes. is a low TC material. Yes. But now this charge density wave, which you see in IPCO and other high TC, real high TC superconductors. I'm so sorry. are they of the same type or different type? Well, again, it seems to be of a kind of different uh, type in the sense that the thing in, in, the, in the 214 compound is that you get a relationship between the incommensurability of the magnetic order and the incommensurability of the charge order. Yeah. And in YBCO, so of course at that doping level, you don't have, uh, you, you don't have the, um, the, the, the magnetic order anymore. Uh, but there's one thing that you can say, uh, two things. First one, you can restore the, 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 the low energy magnetic fluctuation. So you can, you can kind of pin down the magnetic fluctuations by, without changing the doping by putting some non-magnetic impurities. So we've done that. And well, to, to, to make it short, there you find the static magnetic order at 0.1 at the same doping. And you find the charge order. So the charge order is reduced. But the wave vector is 0.31. So it's completely incommensurate with the, with the magnetic order. They, they, there's no simple uh, uh, relation. Yeah. And the second thing is that the doping dependence of the two is different. So the, 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 the incommensurability of the magnetic order increases uh, when you go, uh, when, when you dope to your system, while the incommensurability of the charge order is decreasing uh, 
uh, when you when you increase the doping. So one is like that, and one is like that. So, but in at least in YBCO and in the BISCO compound, and of course in the in the in the in the two one four in the lanthanum compound, the two go together. I, I don't know why. So. If you think of it in terms of, uh, of these Fermi arcs, it might just be a T prime effect and just the fact that the Fermi surface has a very different shape in the, in the 214. I, 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 honestly, I don't know. But for at least, so YBC1 and BISCO compound, where we looked at the, uh, the, the doping dependence, it, it doesn't go in the same direction as the, as the magnetic order. Well, you said even in LSCO 124, uh, the stripes and the CDW are different. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no. Well, no, no. No, in, in, in the in the LSEO, uh, uh, what, I, what I said is that in LSEO, the charge order always sets in above the magnetic order. So what, what I don't understand is why the two incommensurability will match and, and, uh, in, in, an, in LSEO and not in, in the other compound. This is really, for me, an open question. But Again, if you start from, from, from high temperature and you cool down, it's always the charge order that's set up first. So uh, this might be the driving force somehow. Yeah, it's a very hot topic, and we can continue discussion during the lunch time. Thank you very much. Thank you.